Welcome back, Pithy listeners. I hope you enjoyed our episode on the Lost Colony, and I would love to hear your own deductions. Based on the presented evidence, what do you think happened to the 117 men, women, and children of the failed Roanoke Colony? If you haven't listened to the whole episode yet, please do so now. It's a great piece of American history and an intriguing mystery. Today's Small Bite does not hold any spoilers. Instead, I am taking y'all out for a drink. Metaphorically, I'm afraid to say. Next week, we will be experimental mixologists. A friend of mine sent me a cheeky text saying how much she enjoyed listening to our podcast with a large glass of wine whilst indulging in a bubble bath. And I thought, what a decadent idea. So be on the lookout for our Women's History Month special called Bubbles and Bites, a drink pairing menu. For each of our episodes this month, we will offer a custom cocktail tailored to the subject matter at hand, so you can feel free to sit back, relax, maybe enjoy a good soak, while listening to our sarcastic historic tales, which I believe are only improved by a toasty tipple. Anywho, in honor of our bubbles and bites, let me introduce you to the Brewery Brides, women who were sent over from England to help the fledgling colonies quench their thirst. Because what is life without beer? For the English, the answer was clear. The first male colonists of Jamestown felt confident in their ability to survive. After all, who would make such a dangerous journey without at least some level of self-confidence? They were strong, determined, capable. But when they arrived to the new world, they discovered a debilitating problem they didn't know how to brew beer. (gasps) This might sound silly to some, but for the English, beer was in fact like water. Back in ye olde Mother England, alcohol was safer to drink than water, as somehow they never realized that throwing their own waste into their drinking water was a bad idea. So beer, or frankly, any fermented alcohol, rid drink of its nasty little pathogens. Additionally, the British society at the time considered beer and other distilled spirits to be nutritional, as they provided both sustenance and water. Along with the health concerns, it was also a matter of taste. The English claimed to dislike the taste of water, and therefore would get along very well with my four-year-old son, who claims to hate water in a remarkably obvious ploy to drink only chocolate milk. But... Considering what they poured into their own water supply, it probably did taste pretty bad. So these brave strapping men were literally dying of thirst as they refused to drink the generally very clean and refreshing spring water of the new world. Though once they started using it as a waste dump, it probably was far less palatable. They went so far as to post signs claiming, death to him who drinks. Mm. Oh well. The Virginia Tobacco Company needed to act. As brewing was considered women's work at the time, they needed to import some ladies pronto. And hoping to cure the male colonists' loneliness and connect them to the new land, the company wanted to make these brewing ladies brides. So they advertised for just that. Quote, young, handsome, and honestly educated maids with good references and an empty ring finger. The original goal was 100 women to be shipped off to the colonies, but I guess willing young women with the requisite skills weren't as easy to come by as expected. So in the end, 57 women crossed the mighty Atlantic in search of adventure, a new life, and of course, a husband. This was actually a second attempt at procuring brides. The first had gone very badly. The men complained their bridal options were quote unquote corrupt and of so bad a choice as made the colony afraid to desire any others. I don't know what happened there, but oof. Historians are slightly more charitable, referring to them as vagrant children and abandoned waifs. Either way, the next shipment needed to be made of stronger and more honest stuff. All 57 women came from decent families, 
Many were daughters of artisans and gentry, a few even claimed relation to knights of the realm, and all held, literally, in their hands, letters of recommendation highlighting their moral upbringing and their housewifery skills, including the indispensable brewing of beer. The youngest was just 16, perhaps even a touch younger, and the oldest was 28. Most of them were maids, though there were three widows on board, and one young lady actually came over with her mother and father. Talk about helicopter parents. But all of them lacked a natural defender, meaning they had no man in their life to care for them. And then the colonists and the women were given months and months to get to know each other, form bonds of friendship from which love bloomed until the time was right and both parties felt called to marriage. Ha! <laughs> or not. There was an auction. Yes, an auction. The starting price was set at 150 pounds of the best leaf tobacco. After all, the investors who had paid for these ladies' fare and upkeep needed a return. It was therefore believed by the company that only the, quote, most honest and industrious planters would be able to bid on a wife. But once these women were married and installed in their new households, they found the beer-making facilities wanting. First, there was no wheat or hops, you know, the usual options for brewing. Second, the American South was far too hot to make ale without refrigeration or pasteurization. And third, distilling equipment was large, expensive, liable to explode, and pretty much completely unavailable. However, as we all know, women are notoriously resourceful. Guess some things never change. They used spruce essence to replace the bitter hops, ground ivy to act as a preservative, hopefully steering clear of the poisonous kind, because that would be very unpleasant. While American apples differed greatly from the British varieties, the brewing brides experimented with new fruits like persimmons and even produced fermentable sugars with pumpkin, corn, molasses, and ginger root. There were also celebratory brews. Bride ale was beer specially brewed and sold during weddings, the proceeds of which went to the bride likely the one making the beer. And then there was groaning beer, to be consumed during and after labor by both the new mother and her midwives, because that's what I want while pushing, heavy, foamy beer and a drunk assistant. Variety is the spice of life, and these women learn to make beer, cider, mead, ale, brandy, whiskey, and all from their newfound, new world ingredients. And while it took a while to really firm up the recipes, many of which survive to this day, they became quite proficient and were eventually able to provide their husbands and children of truly any age with a steady flow of good drink. Fun fact, by 1770, the average white American male drank the equivalent of seven shots of rum per day, while the average white woman imbibed up to two pints of hard cider. They were metaphorically drenched in alcohol. No longer were the American colonists belittled by the term water drinkers. And yes, that's what their countrymen back home called them. Really weird insult, but hey, whatever. You do you. Like the colonies themselves, American alcohol production grew and expanded. Eventually, the operation became commercialized, at which point the women were systematically squeezed out. With industrialization came uniformity those unique homebrewed flavors began to disappear in favor of the generic. Although I think we can see a resurgence of flavorful variety in the craft breweries of today, often attempting to recreate these early American beverages with recipes that were preserved and passed down by the very women who brewed them. 401 years ago, the 57 Brewster brides stepped foot on American soil, answering the men's prayers both for beer and for wives. Sadly, few likely survived to the summer of 1623. With a few lucky exceptions, most perished in a brutal attack by neighboring American Indians in 1622, which was then followed by the quote-unquote starving winter. But these brave women paved the way for so many others, and their creativity and scrappiness live on not just in American craft brews, but 
I like to think, and American women as well. And that, my friends, is that. Thanks for listening. If you have the time or inclination, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Every little bit helps us out immensely. Cheers!